West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com These two guys from opposite sides of the partisan political tracks formed together a bipartisan legal defense network, specifically for election officials. The elections officials legal defense network they formed has signed up top shelf A-list lawyers and law firms all over the country to volunteer their services to to represent and defend election workers at all levels who get threatened now because of their work, who get who are facing intimidation and potentially malicious legal actions or even prosecution because they work on elections. This week, Ginsburg and Bauer went to Wisconsin saying that their network that they formed to defend election workers has noticed an intensification of threats against election officials in Wisconsin. They said in an op-ed they published together right before they arrived, quote, Wisconsin has become ground zero for attempts by political actors to achieve partisan control over a state's election process. In conjunction with this partisan 2020 election review the Republicans have been carrying out, Bauer and Ginsburg said that Wisconsin has, quote, featured baseless threats of criminal prosecution against election officials. They showed up in Wisconsin this week basically to say, we're here to help. They showed up there this week to backstop that Republican senator, Kathy Bernier, who was willing to sit there with them and take that stand. They showed up there this week also to publicly warn that the Trump election deniers who are now threatening public servants in that state, they should think twice. They might need to back up off of that. Those election officials who should be defended and are looking for defense will be defended and the network is available to provide them with that legal counsel should they need it. And we will do so quickly. We've pressure tested it. We've been able to do this for election officials around the country and we will continue to do that. I should also point out that those who are issuing those threats should understand that properly represented election officials who are defending themselves will have something to say about abuse of process, about malicious prosecution, about people in law enforcement who have law degrees who are disregarding the constraints on their behavior imposed by the bar rules and who can face a call for disciplinary action for misusing their licenses or in the case of public officials, misusing their official responsibility for partisan political purposes to try to subvert the electoral process by undermining the ability of election officials through threats and intimidation to do their jobs. In other words, if you're coming for elections officials, if you are threatening and intimidating election officials, you better come correct. Because that is not a free punch. That is not something that you... These are not folks who you can freely swing at and freely intimidate in this way. There will be consequences for people who maliciously do this. Joining us now is Bob Bauer, former White House counsel, uh, senior advisor to President Biden's campaign. He's now a law professor at NYU. Mr. Bauer, it's really nice to see you. Thanks for making time to be here tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. 
What's the relationship between this now apparently indefinitely extended review, this partisan revision that Republicans are doing in Wisconsin, and the kinds of threats to election workers that you and Mr. Ginsburg um, have set about trying to um, help people defend themselves from? Yes, the audit is one of the tools in the current toolkit for intimidating and harassing election officials. These are not professional audits. In Wisconsin, the assembly directed audit led by a former state Supreme Court justice, uh, Michael Gableman, whose name appeared on your screen. This Mr. Gableman has acknowledged he doesn't know anything about running an election. But however, he did come into the audit with a view that the 2020 election had resulted in theft. It was fraudulent voters had been stolen from. So he knows nothing about elections or how they're run, but he had an opinion. And he's the person the assembly chose to put in charge of this audit. We've seen this before. We've seen this in, say, Arizona with the so-called Cyber Ninjas audit that was also an embarrassment. It once again involved people who did not know anything about running an election, much less auditing one after the fact. But election officials now understand, and this is the key point, that partisan actors are seeking to subvert nonpartisan election administration. And I came to know Ben Ginsburg quite well over the years. Of course, we've been on the opposite side of the partisan divide in any number of contexts, but I came to know him very well when we co-chaired President Obama's Commission on Election Administration. And we understood then that the country was supposed to be moving and the commission was meant to help the country continue to move in the direction of nonpartisan election administration. What we're seeing is a 180 degree radical turn in the opposite direction toward partisan control of the electoral process. You have been sort of sounding an alarm about that for months now, not just the intimidation of election workers, which you and Ben Ginsburg are taking um, concrete action to try to defend those folks, um, but specifically that partisan hijacking of election administration processes. Um, what do you think? What have you come to believe is the best bulwark against that? We need to do a number of things. We need really an all systems approach to solving the problem. We need to give election administrators around the country protection, which is why we're through the network offering them pro bono legal defenses. And as you point out, letting those who would attack them know, as you put it, it's not a free punch. That's certainly part of it. We need to resist the enactment of laws that are designed to allow partisans to take over the polling place and limit the ability of polling place workers to actually create a safe space for voting. And we're seeing that problem develop in states that are enacting statutes that could have extremely harmful consequences for the conduct of elections in the polling place in the United States. Congress certainly should take a look at the Electoral Count Act, and that is in desperate need of reform. We saw what happened uh, on January 6th, even uh, before the rioting began, uh, the baseless objections and the call on Vice President Pence as president of the Senate to falsify the tally in some way. So there's an enormous amount to be done here to bring back what we thought we would see after the Florida presidential recount in 2000, which is a country that was fully committed to nonpartisan expert election administration. Now we see a movement that just has to be resisted toward putting partisans in control of the electoral process where they clearly have a stake and counting the results the way they would like to see them counted. Bob, one, one last very quick question. It's something that you mentioned in your op-ed this week. Am I correct that the election officials' uh, legal defense network that you and Mr. Ginsburg have formed, that you are still soliciting volunteers? You're still looking for lawyers and law firms to do pro bono representation for election workers when they are threatened? You're still looking for people to help? We are very much welcoming the help. We have recruited now hundreds of lawyers. We have deployed them in particular circumstances to help and to consult with election officials under attack. Our view, however, is that as the presidential campaign in 24 approaches and even in 2022, we have to have a massive force available to provide this kind of defense. So yes, we would welcome the help and we're continuing to look for it. The Election Officials Legal Defense Network, a truly bipartisan effort. Um, Bob Bauer, former White House counsel, uh, thank you so much for being with us, Mr. Bauer. It's nice to see you. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. It is Thursday, the 16th of December of 2021. 
and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, a little bit of jambalaya. A little bit of spice in your life. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Thursdays could also be called Pirate Day, I suppose. I matey. No, it won't. <laughs> but we do have uh, the grits already warmed up and ready to go. Because that's how we do it. Some people do it uh, individually, but that takes too long. Especially the kind of grits I like to use. None of this instant stuff. Eek! Okay, um, looks like Urban Meyer is out as uh, the coach of the Jaguars. And there are some people positing right now that, wow, if he treated grown men like this, how did he treat those kids at college? Well, you know exactly how he treated those kids at college. I mean, come on, look at the guy. Okay. I I don't really like the fact that these uh, coaches, uh, you know, in college, like an Urban Meyer, gets the equivalent of what I counted uh, this Tuberville salary when he was uh, coaching in college. His yearly salary would have supported almost 30 full-time tenured professors. Tenure track. Tenured. Yes. And it was adjunct stuff. So one guy. Tuberville. Think of that. Is it Tuber or Tuba? I don't know. He's a root vegetable as far as I'm concerned. And uh, about uh, as intelligent. In fact, I think a root vegetable has much more intelligence, even though they're a vegetable. So Urban Meyer. The first time I ever heard Urban Meyer, I thought they were talking about a metropolitan skin disease. Sometimes these jokes don't take very long. And maybe I should take longer to consider not doing it. But I like to anyway, spontaneously. See how it goes. It's Thursday. The week's almost up. <laughs> yeah. You know, days are like any other day. I, I, one is not any more or any less special than another. But it is Thursday, and we got shrimp and grits going. Oh, my. So Urban Meyer's out, and I got the uh, metropolitan skin disease joke uh, out. And ready to rumble. (laughs) Speaking of ready to rumble, Mark Meadows' lawyer is just making BS out of Hulk BS. I don't get it. How is it all of a sudden the laws are totally different? They totally have to be changed because they're just... I suppose if people never had any idea how their government worked... They would think, oh, yeah, well, you know, he shouldn't have to testify in a court of law. God, can you imagine this stuff? People are now saying this. Oh, yeah, just defy the law. And they're all a bunch of white people, too. And I should know I'm white. I can recognize them. I kind of blend. They think they can tell me things uh, that they would never tell anybody, but they tell me because I blend. So, they are so upset that Trump and his cronies have to testify in front of the communists. Yeah, Adam Schiff is a communist. They, they pluraled communists. God, they, oh, God. This is what happens when you ban books in the schools, apparently. Uh, no wonder they want to ban books in the schools. They don't know how to read them. They might be able to read something off their phone, barely. Maybe it's the emojis that they're deciphering. Hieroglyphs. The modern hieroglyph. Boy, we're going to have big time trouble in the distant future when people try to figure out how the hell we communicated. For prosperity. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, well, there's so much. Just so much going on. The... The abject uh, disregard for the law by these, well, shall we say, uh, insurgent. 
insurgent traitors. Could we go that far? I know the ultimate punishment for a traitor is, you know. But it looks to me like they were trying to destroy the United States of America, and some of them got foreign help and have had it for quite some time. We have the Flynn brothers. I still don't understand how Mike Flynn's brother is still in the military. Are we just because we're nice? We don't want to make it look like we're going after the family for reprisal purposes. No, I think the guy's in on it. Oh, we can't hold a former president accountable for crimes. Yes, you can. Jesus. We're treading... uh, New water. We've never done this before. Well, well, you know, we never had a guy run for president and win with foreign help from a hostile foreign nation, by the way. One who has declared war on us. Yeah, they're fighting asymmetrical warfare, but it might as well be tanks, and we know that. Once they start attacking our infrastructure, our banks, our medical facilities, give me an effing break. Oh, well, it's because it's a mob government. It's not a real government. I don't care. They got nukes. They declared war on us. Anybody in cahoots with them is by definition a traitor. I know technically that we are the ones that have to declare war. But look, they're throwing the big roundhouse kicks right now and connecting a few times. Luckily, damage is still done. Anybody in cahoots with that is not, well, defending the United States of America, are they? Yeah, they think they can ride the tail of the tiger. Well, it's not a tiger, it's a bear. You don't ride the tail of a bear. Trust me. Jeez, these people. Well, as I intimated, or I was actually just uh, quite overt, So much going on that we had to curate a show. We had to because we do it every day. (laughs) We're on five days a week. And uh, we might as well let you know what's up for the curated part of the show. And at the top, yes, Rachel spoke with Bauer, who's with Ginsburg. I'm not a big fan of Ginsburg, but, you know, I guess he is an institutionalist after all. Who knew? Well, Election officials have them in the quiver when needed. And it looks to me like they're very proactive. And anybody making threats against election workers is going to be in big trouble. Big. You want a corrupt democracy? Well, you're going to have to pay a price. On the rest of the menu here on this fine Metro Shrimp and Chris Thursdays, a Houston-based oil company and two subsidiaries were indicted for a crude oil spill that fouled Southern California beaches in October. Fouled. Project Veritas nearly doubled its funding in 2020 while amplifying baseless election fraud claims. It's a growing, it's a growth industry. That whole thing's a growth industry. I don't want to be a part of it. And the White House pushed the GOP to end its blockade of ambassador picks. Yeah, they're kind of interrupting our ability to secure our nation. No wonder they tried to overthrow it in January. After the break, we move to the chef's table where the U.N. watchdog reported that Iran will allow new cameras at its damaged nuclear centrifuge site. And Paris is celebrating the 100th birthday of the Bloody Mary. Cheers, Bon Appetit. Yeah, it's all that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link. And the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. Oh, we just got noticed that uh, Kelly uh, uh, had the most watched YouTube uh, episode on our uh, on our network. So I thought that was pretty astounding. Way to go, Kelly. Okay. Uh, also, if you would then look ac- across the page near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, uh, there is the link to our Patreon page. And you know what to do. If you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio and send us what you might spend on an espresso-type coffee drink, send those funds to us once a month, we are able to use those funds with what we already pull out of our wallets and pay our bills and fly into the radar and continue this resistance against the hostile fascist takeover of the United States of America. Thank you for your generosity and thank you for your generosity in the future. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Thank you, Tom, for taking care of that. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. And uh, incidentally, I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. Get that linked up on Twitter and other social media platforms. Of course you do. And if you would like to follow the show, do so at Cookbook West on Twitter. And pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found. All right. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is by Brian Melly and Matthew Brown of the Associated Press. A Houston-based oil company and two subsidiaries were indicted yesterday, Wednesday, for a crude oil spill that fouled, that's a nice way of putting it, fouled Southern California waters and beaches in October. An event prosecutors say was caused in part by failing to properly act when alarms repeatedly alerted workers to a pipeline rupture. Amplify Energy Corp. and its companies that operate several oil rigs and a pipeline off Long Beach were charged by a federal grand jury with a single misdemeanor count of illegally discharging oil. Investigators believe the pipeline was weakened when a, sh- when a cargo ship's anchor snagged it in high winds in January, months before it ultimately ruptured on October 1st spilling up to about 25,000 gallons of crude oil in the ocean. That's a lot, you know. A lot of paint cans. U.S. prosecutors said the companies were negligent six ways, including failing to respond to eight leak detection system alarms over a 13-hour period that should have alerted them to the spill and would have minimized the damage. Instead, the pipeline was shut down after each alarm and then restarted, spewing more oil into the ocean. Amplify blamed the unnamed shipping company for displacing the pipeline and said workers on and offshore responded to what they believed were false alarms because the system was not functioning properly. It was signaling a potential leak at the platform, where no leak was occurring, the company said. The leak, in fact, was from a section of undersea pipe four miles away, Amplify said. Had the crew known there was an actual oil spill in the water, they would have shut down the pipeline immediately. Well, you know what? Maybe they should have.
Isaac Stanley Becker of the Washington Post brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Two days after the 2020 election, as Donald Trump raised alarm about massive voter fraud, Project Veritas produced a video it claimed furnished stunning proof. The organization, which has used deceptive tactics and attempts to expose alleged wrongdoing by journalists, liberals, and labor unions, aired accusations from a Pennsylvania postal worker who said his supervisors had tampered with mail-in ballots. The video was cited in right-wing media and by a top Republican lawmaker. Then, the claims fell apart. The worker recanted to federal agents, but as its high-profile investigation was being debunked, Project Veritas was concluding a banner year for fundraising. The organization nearly doubled its revenue last year, according to a recent public filing, because, I gotta tell you, fascism sells. And it pays, too. Project Veritas, led by James O'Keefe, raised about $22 million in 2020, compared with 12 in 2019. The tax filing show... O'Keefe earned a salary of $412,000 from the group, whose methods have drawn scrutiny from federal law enforcement. The FBI last month searched two locations associated with Project Veritas as part of an investigation into how a diary reportedly belonging to President Biden's daughter, Ashley, became public just before the 2020 election. O'Keefe age 37, said his group acquired the diary lawfully and did not publish it because its authenticity could not be confirmed. The fundraising boom shows how Project Veritas has capitalized on confrontational tactics and baseless claims of election fraud, which is a nice way of saying they're rat fuckers, and that pays. Both increasingly mainstream in the Republican Party with expanded resources, it is seeking to press its case in Washington, recently hiring as first lobbyist an ex-aide to former Vice President Mike Pence to inform lawmakers about his interactions with the FBI. An attorney for Project Veritas did not respond to a request for comment. Do they ever? But O'Keefe, in a statement reacting to the FBI action, defended his methods as news gathering and said, It appears journalism itself may now be on trial. Uh, James, what you're doing is not journalism. Stop hiding behind that. This October, a federal judge ruled in an unrelated civil action that Project Veritas could present itself in such a light but that the group's opponents could characterize it differently as a political spying operation. The judge affirmed that, ju that the jury would decide which characterization it finds most per persuasive. Because Project Veritas is set up as a 501c3 charitable organization, it is exempt from disclosing its donors or paying federal income tax. In return... It is supposed to abstain from campaign activity. Details of its financing, however, can be glimpsed in separate disclosures by its benefactors. More than a quarter of its revenue last year came from the Bradley Impact Fund, a donor-advised conservative philanthropy based in Milwaukee, according to a tax filing by that group. The fund gave Project Veritas a grant of six and a half million bucks, Bradley's largest expenditure last year, and far more than it has provided to Project Veritas in all other years since 2012 combined. Christine Chernonuski, a spokeswoman for the Bradley Impact Fund, declined to comment on the Project Veritas grant, but wrote in an email that the nonprofit's principles include a, quote, belief in constitutional order, free markets, a strong civil society, informed citizens, and donor intent. Oh, that's gobbledygook for saying, yeah, they're pretty much fascists. 
The grant from the Bradley Impact Fund was identified by the Watchdog Group, documented and confirmed by the Washington Post through public filings. Beyond the Bradley Impact Fund, it's not fully clear which other benefactors Benefactors accounted for the rise in Project Veritas' revenue, but smaller sums have come from a range of philanthropies. Donors Trust, another prominent donor-advised fund that allows its contributors to remain anonymous, gave just over $1 million to the group. The Gardner Grout Foundation, a Reno-based philanthropy that lists no mission statement or employer employees on its tax filings, contributed $325,000 last year, more than three times the amount it gave the year before. Madhani and Kevin Frecking of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. President Joe Biden unveiled two more ambassador nominees yesterday, Wednesday, but the White House and Democrats warned that maneuvering by some Senate Republicans, we're looking at you, Tom Cotton, to block all but a small fraction of diplomatic and other national security appointees is doing Serious harm to U.S. efforts around the globe. I would think that's a feature, not a bug. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has threatened to keep lawmakers who are eager to get home for Christmas at work in Washington into next week if progress is not made on the backlog of more than 70 ambassadorial nominees awaiting votes. Biden administration officials acknowledge the president will almost certainly end his year with significantly more ambassadorial vacancies than any of his recent predecessors, and that the slowdown of ambassadorial and other national security picks has already had an impact on U.S. relations overseas, considering how much all of it was gutted by you-know-who. It's long past time for GOP senators to get out of the way and let the Senate quickly confirm these national security nominees so they can advocate for the interests of the American people around the world, said White House Principal Deputy Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre. As of Tuesday, only 13 of Biden's 85 ambassadorial nominees have been confirmed by the Senate. At the same point in the three previous administrations, presidents had far more of their diplomats confirmed and installed at embassies around the globe. Trump had 44 of his 60 nominees confirmed, Barack Obama 72 of 96, and George W. Bush 93 out of 103. Well, let's get to our break, and when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Emily Schwing. 
The boreal forest is the largest terrestrial biome in the world. It covers 14% of the land on Earth. And today I'm here with my dogs on the north side of Denali National Park and Preserve. Come on. What? Come on. I'm walking my dogs through the boreal forest. It's also known as taiga. It covers 1.3 billion acres of the Earth's surface. This forest is actually really beautiful. There's these black spruce trees. They're stumpy. Sometimes they're really short and growing in different directions. There's lichen that hangs off of the dead branches, bright green lichen. Today there's a skim of snow on the ground over top of this feather moss that just covers the forest floor. There's a magpie on, the, on a tree branch right in front of me. Wildfire is a normal part of the life cycle for the boreal forest, but as the climate warms, this ecosystem is becoming increasingly vulnerable. That vulnerability risks turning this forest from a carbon sink into a carbon source. When the boreal forest burns, it has the potential to release gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere. In the global context, one of the reasons why boreal forests are really important is that they store a lot of carbon. And much of that carbon is actually in the forest floor. Jill Johnstone has been studying boreal forest ecology for decades. She does research through Canada's Yukon University and with the University of Alaska Fairbanks. It's this undecomposed plant remains that accumulate through time. And when a fire comes through the forest, it can just singe the surface of those uh, accumulated plant remains, or it can burn deeply into them like a severe burn combusts most of that forest floor. That results in a pulse of released carbon to the atmosphere in the form of smoke and other aerosols and small uh, carbon dioxide molecules. And so that carbon is essentially lost from storage that burns away. This past spring, a group of scientists released their findings from a 15-year study that looked at how boreal forests regenerate after wildfire. John Stone was a co-author. Well, one of the things that we've been noticing in the past couple of decades is that fires are burning differently in the boreal forest than we understand them to have burned in the past. And as a result of that, how the forest regenerates is changing. Black spruce and fir are the dominant tree species in the boreal forest. These trees are coniferous, they're good at withstanding cold, and they grow really slowly. Particularly fires that burn deep into the forest floor, and they change the seedbeds, and that affects which tree species regenerate well. And as a result, we're seeing that recovery process shifting to what we call alternative trajectories. A change in climate means wildfire is becoming more severe. It's burning off the organic layer of soil that supports species like black spruce. So after a severe fire, the environment is better suited for deciduous tree species like birch and aspen to get a foothold. These trees grow much faster. And here's where John Stone and her colleagues discovered an unexpected twist. Even though extreme fires are burning up those carbon-rich layers of organic soil and releasing that carbon into the atmosphere in the short term, what grows back is even more carbon-hungry than what came before it. John Stone says this new kind of boreal forest is storing carbon four times faster than it would have before it burned. I think that... I would have anticipated something like twice as fast, not necessarily four times as fast. And the reason that this number is really interesting, this increase in rate or or so remarkable to us is that prior to this point, we always assumed that the stands that burned severely were a net source of carbon to the atmosphere. 
meaning they lost more carbon in the fire than they could hope to reaccumulate before the next fire came through. Ecologists like Johnstone have worried for years about the amount of carbon that could be lost to the atmosphere from wildfire in the boreal forest, because that could lead to what she calls a runaway feedback loop with climate change. And so this example of more rapid accumulation of carbon in deciduous broadleaf stands is a way of thinking of putting the brakes on the runaway train. And uh, it's really valuable to recognize that by changing the type of vegetation that recovers after fire, we actually change the carbon accumulation rate. John Stone says the change in vegetation regime might help bring the system back into control, at least for a bit. There are limits to this seeming self-regulation. So let's let's change the metaphor to driving a bus down the highway. And uh, what we are concerned about is that as fire as climate warming leads to more fire weather, we get more severe and active fires burning in the boreal forest that releases more carbon. And that's just pushing the accelerator pedal down on this bus. The added carbon accumulation as the forest regime regenerates and shifts from coniferous to deciduous trees, that's like putting the parking brake on while driving the bus, says Johnstone. So you're slowing down that acceleration, but It's not enough to stop it completely. And as long as we are continuing to pump carbon into the atmosphere, particularly through our own fossil fuel combustion, then we're going to keep accelerating. But this feedback of vegetation change in the boreal forest is, is at least pushing back against that acceleration to slow us down. And we need to use all the tools available to us to help slow that bus down because it's it's headed to go over a cliff. Discovering this natural shift took some sleuthing. This research really played out like a detective novel. At first, we noticed, oh, the fires seem to be doing different things and asking questions about, well, if the fire the way the fire burns changes, how does that change the forest regeneration? And that required a bunch of experiments and following patterns of forest regeneration for 5, 10, 15 years. Deciduous trees like birch and aspen live for about 100 years. So the team couldn't simply wait for one or two centuries to find out what happens in the forest. So we went out and found all these different aged stands across the boreal forest in Alaska and sampled them and tried to make sure that we had a good comparative set of ages that could be linked together as being probably starting from the same initial conditions and then just of different ages. And that piecing together is like doing a jigsaw puzzle. The pieces of the puzzle that are still missing are the ones that help explain how we pump the brakes enough to keep that bus from reaching the cliff. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Emily Schwing. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com. All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our netrootsradio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. In a world that's clogged and choking with a massive overdose of plastic trash you'll be heartened to learn that governments and industries are teaming up to respond forcefully to this planetary crisis. 
Unfortunately, their response has been to engage in a global race to make more plastic stuff and to force poor countries to become dumping grounds for plastic garbage. Leading this Kafkaesque greed fest are such infamous plunderers and polluters as ExxonMobil, Chevron, Shell, and other petrochemical profiteers. With fossil fuel profits crashing, the giants are rushing to convert more of their oversupply of oil into plastic. But where to send the monstrous volumes of waste that will result? The industry's chief lobbyist outfit, the American Chemistry Council, looked around last year and suddenly shouted, Eureka! There's Africa! In particular, they're targeting Kenya to become a plastics hub for global trade and waste. However, Kenyans have an influential community of environmental activists who've enacted some of the world's toughest bans on plastic pollution. To bypass this inconvenient local opposition, the dumpers are resorting to an old corporate power play, free trade. Their lobbyists are pushing an autocratic trade agreement that would ban Kenyan officials from passing their own laws or rules that interfere with trade in plastic waste. Trying to hide their ugliness, the plastic profiteers created a PR front group called Alliance to End Public Waste. But hello, it's not public waste. Exxon and other funders of the Alliance make, promote, and profit from the mountains of destructive trash they now demand we clean up. This is Jim Hightower saying, the real problem is not waste, but plastic itself. Rather than subsidizing more of the stuff, we should seek out and encourage people who are developing real solutions and alternatives. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. The British were eager to establish colonies in North America in the early 17th century. Britain sought to compete with Spain, France, and the Netherlands, which had already established colonies in the New World. The contest was a struggle between global powers. The Spanish had already claimed huge expanses of land, including present-day California and Texas. At first, Britain was content to capture Spanish ships loaded with gold and other plunder from the New World. The British soon realized that America contained valuable natural resources they sought to exploit directly. Britain also saw North American colonies as a way to counter the Spanish, and to settle the constantly increasing number of the poor. Britain established its first successful colony in Jamestown, Virginia, in 1607. The French established Quebec only one year later, in 1608. In 1609, Henry Hudson, an English sailor hired by the Dutch East India Company, explored what is now called the Hudson River Valley. He was looking for a route to India, but instead handed the Dutch a rich claim to land in what would someday become the state of New York. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1951. That was the day New York City was struck by the Great Bagel Famine. 300 members across 32 bakeries of the Bagel Bakers of America Local 338 walked off the job over wages and working conditions. Morris Siegel, business agent for the local, stated that the Bakers Association had been lax in living up to the welfare fund payments and sanitary provisions of the contract. The Bagel Bakers produced 1.2 million bagels weekly for New York City consumers. The Wisconsin Jewish Chronicle noted, quote, The only ones welcoming this respite are the salmon. Diners, delicatessens, and Teamster delivery drivers were all rocked by the strike, which lasted for six weeks. The two sides were so deadlocked that a mediator who had effectively settled a smoked salmon dispute three years earlier was brought in to help settle the conflict. 
the bagel bakers won a $3 a day wage increase and were ready to return to work. But the Teamsters would not begin deliveries until they were paid for lost wages due to the lack of deliveries made during the strike. The bagel bakers would engage in job actions effectively over the course of the next 15 years until they too suffered the fate of many an industrial worker, that of automation. Their labor would eventually be replaced by labor-saving bagel-making machines by the late 1960s. The Bagel Bakers Local 338 was a union that was based in New York State. And they set the minimum wages of the Yiddish bagel bakeries and controlled all of the stages from the flour sack to the plate. But like the railroad did to the canal. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at laborhistoryin2. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 33 degrees Fahrenheit, foggy conditions, had a little bit of rain and snow falling just a bit ago, should be cloudy skies throughout the morning, looks like another rainstorm coming in in about an hour or so, highs today around 42, winds light and variable, mostly cloudy skies tonight, lows in the low 30s, winds remaining light and variable partly cloudy tomorrow with highs in the low 40s winds light and variable and possibly a little bit more rain tomorrow night and then another bit of snowy rain mix for several more days we do have an update on our confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon, which now stands at 255,052 confirmed infections. And our deceased have increased from 363 to 370. Pollen is rated as none right outside the window in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the region is good at 20 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is low at 1. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.01 inches. Visibility is down to 1.5 miles, and relative humidity is at 100%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 53 and cloudy. Paris is 51 and cloudy. Rome is 56 and clear. Kiev is 37 with a light rain. Kabul is 24 degrees and clear. Hong Kong is 68 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 50 degrees and cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 68 and mostly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 48 and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 56 degrees Fahrenheit and mostly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd, crowdsources from around the world.
Amir Vadat, and John Gambrell of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The United Nations nuclear watchdog and Iran reached a deal yesterday Wednesday to reinstall cameras damaged at an Iranian site that manufactures centrifuge parts, though inspectors remain limited on what footage they can access. The agreement will see cameras put back at Karaj, which came under what Iran described as a sabotage attack in June. Iran has since refused the International Atomic Energy Agency access to replace cameras that were damaged in the incident, part of an ongoing hardline tact taken by Tehran at negotiations underway in Vienna over its tattered 2015 nuclear deal with world powers. Iranian media first reported the deal with outsiding a source and IAEA Director General Rafael Mariano Grossi later tweeted out a statement detailing the arrangement. The IAEA said the cameras would be reinstalled at Karaj in the coming days. Tehran blamed the Karaj assault on Israel aimed at amid a widening regional shadow war since former President Donald Trump unilaterally withdrew America from Iran's landmark nuclear accord with world powers. Negotiations continue in Vienna over trying to restore the deal. However, Iran under hardline President Raisi has taken a maximalist position in negotiations. Anxiety is growing among European nations at the negotiating table. Without swift progress, In light of Iran's fast-forwarding of its nuclear program, the deal will very soon become an empty shell, they recently warned. The U.S. has remained outside of direct talks since abandoning the accord. Je te donne mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Alex Turnbull of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Harry's Bar in Paris is celebrating the 100th birthday of the Bloody Mary. The vodka tomato juice cocktail believed to have been invented at the iconic watering hole in 1921. The centenary events this week bring a welcome respite from winter gloom and worries about the Omicron variant of the coronavirus. The bar is carefully checking COVID-19 health passes as foreign visitors gather to sample the drink closely associated with Harry's Bar, whose patrons over the past century have included writers Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald. According to the history of Harry's, bartender Fernand Petois invented the cocktail, and the recipe was first published in a book called Harry's ABC of Cocktails in 1921. The bar serves an estimated 12,000 Bloody Marys a year. It is a classic drink, bartender Dante Agnelli said, while demonstrating the mixology behind the drink, ingredient by ingredient, salt and pepper, Tabasco sauce, Worcestershire sauce, lemon juice, vodka, and tomato juice. Harry's Bar plans to host a celebration tonight, despite concerns about the spread of the Omicron variant of the coronavirus in Europe and a surge in new virus infections across France. In recent days, the French government expanded the places where passes are required, including all restaurants and a growing number of events and venues to get one. 
People must show proof of full vaccination, a negative virus test less than 24 hours old, or recent recovery from COVID-19. The French government closed nightclubs and tightened social distancing measures, but is trying to avoid a new lockdown. Well, happy birthday, Bloody Mary. Cheers. All right, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on. And we will meet up tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakies. Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coère Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver